see you uh, again uh, today. It seems like this is our way of doing business now. And um, so anyhow, uh, we, uh, we've got a, a full schedule of uh, people uh, to hear from. Um, I think we're going to start off um, with uh, Hannah. I haven't seen Maddie uh, on yet. Is, and uh, so um, we'll, uh, yeah, Ruth. Oh, well, you can finish. I just wanted to say something before everybody started their testimony. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think Maddie has come online yet, and she's supposed to be uh, coming. Uh, but go ahead, Ruth. Uh, and if any of you other folks got anything to say, just, uh, you know, when Ruth finishes, uh, say it, I'd like to say a word. So go ahead, Ruth. Thanks, Bobby. Um, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to um, thank the four Addison County farmers who are here to testify today. Um, as a member, we were talking about a sort of relief package for Vermont agriculture on Wednesday, and we heard from some dairy farmers, and um, which is great. And I know that the dairy farmers are really struggling. Um, and I also wanted to hear from uh, some other types of farmers. So I called for awesome farmers in Addison County who um, do different operations to see what was their situation given the COVID crisis. So that's sort of the genesis of, of having them all on today to talk about different sectors in the ag economy. Yeah, uh, yeah and thank you, Ruth, for, for doing that. And, and uh, thanks, guys, for, for giving up your time and and showing up this morning. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll get to that after we hear from Hannah and um, the farmer markets possibly. Um, um, so uh, Hannah, you're, you're on, you're muted. Thanks, good, everybody can hear me loud and clear. Yeah. Um, thanks everyone for having me. Thanks Ruth for inviting me um, to uh, tell my story a little bit. Um, sorry about that, okay. Uh, so just really briefly, um, a little bit about our operation. Um, we um, milk 130 goats and we process all the milk into cheese. We started our farm in 2002. Um, so kind of like before the big wave of, of cheesemakers um, came into Vermont, um, about half, almost half the milk we process is cow's milk that we purchase from a small, tiny farm in Whiting, Vermont. They milk 15 Ayrshire cows. So they are living the dream, uh, being a micro dairy. Um, uh, we're their largest uh, market for milk. Um, so, um, when everything went down um, in March, it was not only scary like for our business, but also because this other farm is reliant on us for their livelihood. Uh, so uh, typically just over half of our cheese uh, was sold through distributors. So basically there's uh, kind of four, four avenues of sales that we kind of have in our portfolio. One um, would be direct to consumer. You can do that two ways. We've, we've done, far, we did farmer's markets for the first 15 years of our business. Um, wonderful, wonderful way to start a business because uh, you don't have to wait to get paid. Very quick turnaround. Um, awesome community support and a really great way to test out different products. Um, so wonderful, wonderful way to start a business. Um, then we sort of evolved out of that a little bit in that our children became teenagers and we needed to be uh, shuttling them around on the weekends. Um, so uh, we started focusing more on wholesale. So two ways to do wholesale. One would be direct to stores. You sell direct to stores and there's no middleman. The other way is through distributors and um, we use several distributors um, in Vermont and across the Northeast. 
And then the last way to do direct retail is over the internet. So um, we had had the, all those four methods of sales in our portfolio, the biggest of which was distributors. Probably 60% of our product went through distributors. Much of that cheese went to restaurants. And so when all the restaurants closed, our sales dropped by 50%, basically overnight. Uh, so that sent us reeling a little bit. Um, we took a week, we regathered ourselves and we said, okay, um, what can we learn from this? And what really is going on here? Well, basically what I think what this whole crisis has shown us is the market, like my web developer said, the market was going this direction. It just went there in five days, what would have taken five years which is a more direct-to-consumer market. The direct-to-consumer market has been growing uh, for quite a long time, unbeknownst to, um, unbeknownst to us who kind of had our heads down and just doing what we could to manage the day-to-day -day of our business. Um, can, everybody, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, good. Very, very clear. <laughs> With the Zoom, sometimes you're talking into the void, but great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we took a week, we refocused, um, and we pivoted our business. And we're lucky that we're small enough that we can kind of pivot on a dime. Not quite a dime, but pivot on a dollar bill. And uh, we beefed up our website. Fortunately, we, we, we already had a website that could accommodate online sales. <laughs> um, we beefed that up. Um, we added some more like bulk items, thinking that people might be, you know, relying more on on, on web orders for like sustenance of, uh, you know, larger amounts of food. So we beefed up our our website and we started looking for new accounts that focus more on direct to consumer or direct to store, basically mostly through the mail. Um, and I was really shocked. Uh, we just advertised on social media. Um, the next step that we're working on is to acquire an email list and have email correspondence. Um, I took several free webinars online about shipping product direct to consumers. Many farms across the country are very generous with their time and their knowledge about setting up a business like that. Um, basically, I feel like this, this crisis is an opportunity, and in our business, it's opened our eyes um, to what turned out to be um, maybe a better way and a more sustainable way for us to, uh, to do business. Um, so long, long story short, um, we have... Um, we have accounted, we have made up for 100% of the losses uh, from our restaurant accounts just through online sales and through a tiny little farm stand that we put um, on the farm here, which moves an astonishing amount of cheese for basically it's a glorified birdhouse with a little cooler in there. And we move an astonishing yeah. amount of cheese. And we live on a dirt road uh, in rur rural Vermont. So People are looking for um, the opportunity to buy local. And I think that's what we've learned. Um, people also want to have that relationship with where their food comes from. And we've said that for a long time, but this crisis has actually proven that really, really to be true. Um, that the direct uh, from farmer sales, um, I think is gonna be the future for farms of our size. Um, so generally, you know, I would say that um, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. I've worked very hard the last uh, month to completely um, to redevelop all these all these markets. Um, but I, I I honestly don't don't think that um, we would be interested in going back to uh, the direction that we were going before, which was just focusing on the urban market, Boston, New York. Get, getting, you know, moving cheese through distributors. Um, I have actually found it really rewarding to have that um, direct to consumer relationship and 
I think in the future, um, I think the key term that we all need to keep in our in our mindset is shortening the food chain. So I think that's where we're going to find resilience. Um, and we think that in rural Vermont, we can't do that because we're so far from the population centers. But I'm telling you, there's a there's a lot of ways to access those population centers um, without going through many, many, many different hands. Um, <clears throat> that would be my, my thought is there's opportunities there to shorten the food chain. We need to promote and support the organizations that help to do that. So the Center for Agricultural Economy, I called them up right away. They were incredibly helpful. They helped us um, get some little micro technical grants that helped us access new markets. Um, so I think that farm forest viability, you know, I think that there's groups out there that are gonna give technical support to farmers who just need that little bit of technical assistance to really unlock uh, a market. Um, that's my feeling. Um, I think that for a long time, Vermont has been stuck on looking for where's the next Ben and Jerry's. And I guess my thought would be, what if the next Ben and Jerry's is actually 2000 little smaller businesses like ours. And I think that we, this crisis has proven that smaller yes. business or Smaller businesses can be a little more uh, flexible and can pivot um, a little quicker than maybe large businesses. Well, uh, thank you, Hannah. I was going to ask you uh, how you were going to take care of your restaurant clients, uh, but you already answered that and said you'd just as soon not go back in that direction. Um, well, I don't want to drop any accounts. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, I think three months ago, if you had asked me, where's the future? I would have said the future is in Boston and New York and Chicago and California. And I wouldn't answer that way now, three months and three months later, I wouldn't answer that way. So I certainly value our restaurant accounts. Um, I can't wait for them to come back, but I'm saying, um, I just, have maybe a little bit of a different focus and perspective. Well, certainly, um, I think the uh, people, not only in Vermont, but all of New England, are thinking about shortening up the, the food chain. Uh, mm -hmm. Yesterday, I received um, an email from a Senator Tyre in Massachusetts, who's the assistant uh, leader or minority leader uh, in their state senate wanting to talk about setting up, um, you know, they're short of everything down there, especially mm -hmm. meat, and uh, wanting to set up some kind of a, an interest, uh, interstate deal where they could buy meat from us up here in Vermont. Uh, so yep. I think there there are a lot of opportunities here uh, yes. for us to yeah. move in that direction. Yes. Um, are there questions from uh, any of the committee uh, uh, with Hannah? Yeah, uh, sir, sir Star, I have a question. It's Chris. Yep. Go ahead, uh, uh, Chris. Um, Thank you, Hannah. It, it, it's very interesting. Your your testimony is, um, well, it fits, frankly, what I was kind of hoping we would hear or where I'm hoping we can go, because I, I do think um, you've pinpointed the quote unquote opportunities uh, out of the crisis. So you mentioned some micro grants. I'm wondering if you can, I mean, it, you're sort of uh, maybe the success story and I'm wondering um, if there are um, ideas or strategies that we can consider to help others in the smaller diversified sector, um, you know, have similar success. I, I do think we're all uh, acutely aware of some of the vulnerabilities of the food, um, you know, how far food comes, how, 
how dependent we are on out of state processing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and mm -hmm. at the same time, there's a, that's a vulnerability and we have an opportunity to be more dependent locally. And, and so are there ideas that you would encourage us to look at? We um, potentially have some resources uh, to help small businesses in the ag sector um, kind of replicate your success? Is it small loans? Is it, is it uh, regional infrastructure? I mean, just, just throw ideas at us because we're at a, a collecting, uh, a brainstorming moment here. Yeah. Um, well, I would say the, mo the first thing you could do is say, okay, well, what has a good track record of working right now? And let's try to bolster that. So um, I'm not an expert on all the programs that exist in Vermont right now. The reason being we've been in existence for 20 years and frankly, I haven't used um, anything in some time. I haven't reached out for help in some time. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you the things that have, that have helped us. Uh, the Vermont Land Trust is how we started and built our first uh, cheese operation. Um, and now I'm really, and uh, full disclosure, I serve on the board of the Vermont Land Trust now. <laughs> but uh, that's quite honestly how we started our business um, 20 years ago. Um, they have a really exciting program called the uh, Farmland Access Program. And I really believe in that mission um, because it's finding oftentimes local, not always local, but oftentimes local uh, couples that want to start a business. And um, so the Vermont Land Trust, I think is a proven resource. Um, definitely the VACB, also full disclosure, I used to serve on the VACB board, but the Farm Forest and Viability Program, I think that's a lot of great businesses. Um, and when I did serve on that board, I the first question I'd have for a farm project that, that came up is like, okay, wh where's the market for your product? I think that's gotta be a question that, you know, we can't be naive that this is a competitive uh, market um, that farms are facing today, like any business. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a business like any other. Uh, I would say the Center for Agricultural Economy and all the different food hubs around the state they're doing a great job and they could do a lot more um, in terms of just helping people experiment like a, a licensed kitchen. They could go try making a product. I think we could, we could do a lot more with that. Uh, my feeling is invest in ways that allow farmers to help themselves. You know, we're all entrepreneurs. You have to be a smart entrepreneur uh, to start and operate a farm these days. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a program that I'm, I'm not thinking of now, but um, anything that also that helps farmers collaborate together, I think is great. Uh, for instance, um, now that we're all going to be shipping a lot of product, how can we collaborate on ordering shipping supplies, you know, uh, bulk, bulk purchasing together, you know, would the Center for Agricultural Economy do that? Um, you know, we have this Center for Agricultural Economy that runs uh, Food Connects, a, a delivery service. Could they uh, work with that um, the Boston, the Massachusetts market, the Massachusetts Senator you were mentioning? So there's, um, I'm always a big fan of not reinventing the wheel. If, if there's a program out there that that is successful and maybe could do more with some funding, I would say uh, from a, an efficiency standpoint, that's going to be your best bet. Um, certainly maybe um, newer farmers uh, are a lot more familiar with different programs um, out there that are of assistance. Thank you, that is great help. Yeah, uh, any other questions uh, right now for Hannah? If, um, if not, um, we'll move on to Paul and tell us a little bit about the uh, turkey business okay um everybody hear me okay yeah okay yeah um, so 
So um, we, we grow about 30,000 turkeys a year. About half of them go to the fresh market. The other half are processed into turkey products, ground turkey, sausages. Uh, we make turkey hot dogs, boneless breasts. And those are frozen and sold year round. So we have a, a year round uh, income from that. Um, this uh, crisis has um, increased our product sales, which is what we're selling now, uh, to grocery stores, to retail grocery stores. Our sales to restaurants and uh, college campus uh, kitchens uh, has tanked. And so we're going to have a lot of surplus product on hand uh, come fall. Hopefully things will open up and we'll be able to sell that product. Um, we're concerned now uh, about our uh, slaughter situation in the fall. Uh, to, to back up a second, we uh, grow seasonally. We grow turkeys over the summer. We slaughter mid-October through mid-December, and uh, that's it for the year. We don't grow any turkeys uh, through the winter. It's just too cold and too expensive to do that. We spend the winter with a small crew uh, making these uh, frozen turkey products. So this year, uh, we had to stop that in March because of the threat of uh, our workers uh, getting the virus. And uh, we had, uh, at that time, four Jamaicans working for us. And we sent them home. We sent them home uh, in the end of March, because we were concerned about uh, to figure out having, how to having them here and they getting, getting sick and it just would not be a good situation. So we sent them home. We shut the plant down. We furloughed uh, the local workers. And uh, one, of the, one of the issues now is that uh, our local workers are getting more from unemployment because of the extra $600 than we can afford to pay them. So it's they're better off being unemployed. But right now for us, it doesn't really matter because uh, we're not growing turkeys or processing turkeys. So we're really concerned about this fall because it takes 20 people, 24 people to operate our slaughter plant and 20 of them are from Jamaica. Uh, most of them come here in September, October and pick apples. Uh, when they're finished that, they, we have 20 guys come over and help us. And we've had the same men for, uh, some of them have been here for almost 20 years. Uh, we have an experienced crew. We, we know them all. They know their jobs. There's no training uh, involved when we start slaughtering again because they can go right to work. But we don't have an opportunity to uh, distance people in the slaughter plant six feet apart. It's just not possible. In addition to that, they all live together in a bunkhouse uh, in Shoreham uh, at one of the apple orchards. They all travel together on a bus to and from work. And so we're really concerned about uh, how we're going to handle this and keep them and us safe. Um, and uh, right now, we have no idea what we're going to do. We did receive a call from the Agency of Agriculture, uh, and we're waiting for them to get back to us. Uh, hopefully, they'll have some ideas about uh, how to proceed on this. But uh, right now, we really don't have uh, any any way of, um, of figuring that out. Uh, right now, uh, Jamaicans are coming in to do various uh, uh, jobs in Vermont, uh, but there are delays. Part of the delay is the uh, U.S. Department of Labor is uh, inept at processing paperwork, so it gets hung up or gets lost. And that delays things. The airline flights aren't so dependable today. That's been delaying things, but um, I guess Jamaicans are coming from what we hear. Yeah, this and I guess I can't emphasize more uh, enough that uh, we depend on them. We simply cannot find local help. And I don't 
think even uh, with high unemployment, we'll be able to find uh, enough local help to run our plan. Uh, so we're concerned about that. Half our sales, as I said, is uh, fresh turkeys for Thanksgiving. And it's, we operate this, the slaughter <coughs> 30 days straight before Thanksgiving, uh, running 10, 12 hours a day, every day uh, to get our, to get the job done. And any slowdown uh, makes a big impact on uh, what we can do to, to get those turkeys out. So uh, I guess that's um, the main thing on that. On As far as sales go, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with Hannah that uh, local is the key. And we've uh, been uh, working on that since we started growing turkeys in 1987. We uh, go to all of our stores fairly regularly to uh, emphasize that we're local, our website, our promotional material all emphasize local. And uh, like Hannah, we live on a dirt road. We're an isolated uh, part of uh, Addison County and we get very few uh, walk-in direct sales, but that's increased quite a bit since the virus has struck. Uh, so we've had to set up a social distancing uh, way when people come in to stay back from uh, workers in the, that are serving them and so on. So it's, it's sort of a different income, but it's not, it's not a huge income. But the local, the whole local thing is our big selling point. Local and the fact that it's Vermont, a really high quality product from the state of Vermont. So, um, one last thing is the distributors. Now we we sell um, we distribute uh, about thirty percent of our fresh turkeys ourselves, but we hire Black River Produce to do the trucking, and so and the rest of the turkeys are sold through distributors, and most of our products are sold through distributors. So they're very important to us. There's no way we could operate without them, and there's no way we could operate without Black River produce delivery service. So I think that's also important for some other farmers. And I can't emphasize that enough that we need to do whatever we can to uh, keep them going and helping farmers in Vermont. And I guess I'll, I guess I'll let it go there and see if there's any questions. Well, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, I've got a quite a couple of questions. Uh, with this product that you were distributing to the schools and colleges and different places. Uh, are you are you still making that and are you freezing that or do you have freezers to keep that in or how's that working out? Well, as I as I, as I mentioned, we shut down the processing in the end of March and we haven't started up again yet. We we hope to start again the end of August. Uh, as far as the product we have on hand, it's in the freezer and it will keep. And that's one of the good things about freezing. We, we can keep it um, in a good marketable condition for, for a period of time. So we're okay there as long as that market opens back up again in the fall and with the schools and restaurants. Yeah, and when, <coughs> pardon me, when do you get your uh, little turkeys in <clears throat> your checks. Well, uh, they come, uh, by the way, they're called pults, P O U L T S. Pults? Pults, yes. Uh, they come June, July, and August. And we get half uh, from a hatchery up in Canada and Quebec. And the half of them come from a hatchery in West Virginia. And right now, that's secure. The, the border across uh, to Canada is open for business. Uh, and we, we check regularly with those hatcheries, make sure we're gonna get the product in, the, the chicks, the poults in, <laughs> excuse me. Well, that's, that's good news. Um, other questions uh, for Paul from the committee or members on the panel? Um, I, I, I do have a, <clears throat> question if no one else does 
Um, yeah, go ahead. Paul, Chris. does the, um, the, the whole bird sales in the fall, is that, uh, do you depend on that sort of as, as the, the prime, I, I guess I'm trying to ask, is that a better return for you than the processed or the cutlets, et cetera? Yes, it is. That's our, that's our prime uh, market. At least 50% of our gross income comes from that, from that market. And it's more, much more profitable than, uh, than the products, the frozen product sale. Thanksgiving, luckily, is uh, a holiday that people still celebrate by families getting together. And if this virus interrupts that part of it, that, that may have an impact on, on, on our business. But right now, uh, Thanksgiving is, hasn't turned into uh, holidays like Christmas and Halloween and so on. Uh, it's still uh, a family get together and Turkey is a really important part of it. So we've capitalized on that. I know, I know. Go ahead, Chris. Well, something tells me even if you can't travel far or have large gatherings, people will still eat a lot of turkey. <laughs> so I, I'm hopeful there. Um, Bobby, did you have a question? I, I have a follow-up. Well, just, no, just that like Easter this year was really torn apart and, and I'm sure a lot of hams weren't sold or are used up and hopefully that won't turn into it won't turn this won't turn into that by thanksgiving uh, time go well, ahead did you have another question yeah i did paul you mentioned um sort of a, a, a desire to reopen in the new universe like how you, you mentioned your slaughter facility is too tight for six foot and stuff like that is there a need, um, and and if it applies to you, do you think it's more broad for, say, the agency to have five or six people whose job is to travel either actually or virtually to facilities around the state and help people say, okay, when you're allowed to open up, here's what we recommend. I mean, is that, a, is that a, again, the same question I had sort of for Hannah, help us understand where we can um, offer up some solutions or some assistance that could be broadly applied to our, our ag sector. Yes, I, I think that would be extremely helpful for the agency, especially the uh, inspection division, who's familiar with the slaughter plants and so on, to participate in, in helping us figure out how we're gonna do this. Uh, beyond that, Maybe the health department also, because this uh, the spread of this vir uh, virus is uh, in so many different ways, from handling things to breathing out the uh, virus. That um, it may be, it, I'm sure it would be very helpful if we had some expert people come actually come to our plant and and say, okay, here's we can show them what we're doing now, and here's what maybe they can suggest that we do. Um, and I'm really quite concerned about this because if this second wave comes, like everybody seems to be talking about, it's going to hit uh, us at the wrong time. So Thank far, you. the virus, so far, the virus has not really impacted our, our income and our operation. But this fall is going to be a different. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, any, uh, Bruce? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Paul, you mentioned to me yesterday when we talked and also alluded to it in your testimony that you have some people, I think you said the agency of ag, but maybe it was another, it was a fed, feds um, talking to you about your housing and transportation for your workers. Are they also talking about the setup of your plant or has that not happened yet? Well, it, it was, uh, we got an email from uh, Rose Wilson and somebody else at the agency Vermont Agency bag uh, saying they wanted to talk to us and we responded and said you know we're available at any time uh, but I think that was by phone I think we really need somebody to come here uh, to help us work this out and I think the agency could uh, as I said before be very helpful there okay 
Great. Uh, any other questions for Paul at, right now? If, I just wanted to, um, can I just support what Paul said about Black River? They're a huge part of our business as well. Not only as a distributor, but more importantly, they're our delivery method. That's how we can sell um, straight to stores throughout Vermont and the Northeast as Black River delivers our product. Yeah, do they do they pick up right at the farms? So there's you know very little for ten, for ten years. For ten years, they did pick up right here every Wednesday, but then when Reinhardt bought them out, they said, "No, we're not doing those. We're not. We won't do that anymore." So I actually partner with another local farm and I bring my product there so I consolidate with another farm. Yeah, Let's bring it more convenient location. Um, in our, in our I just briefly also thought of three other things. Number one, the farm to family coupons. That was a great program run by the state of Vermont that seemed to benefit two ways. Lower income folks who get these farm to family coupons and spend it on local food at the farmer's market. That was an awesome program. And then the farm to school, maybe we could kill two birds with one stone and um, sorry, Paul, no pun intended. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, really bolster like local foods getting into, into schools. And um, lastly, we're not allowed to even claim a tax credit on cheese that we donate to the food shelf. Um, yeah, because it's a value added product. And that, that could use some revisiting because that seems like a, we, we still donate uh, seconds cheese and we donate cheese to the food shop, but we just, we don't get any credit for it whatsoever. I don't know. I think I heard maybe the uh, Department of Ag might be addressing that. There might be an article in this uh, week's Ag Review, but I haven't read it yet. But that would be an easy way to uh, kind of get a double benefit from funds spent. Yeah, uh, thank can you. I, can, I just, uh, can I just say something, uh, Bob? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, so w we depend on Black River for uh, as a distributor and for actually trucking our products that we sell directly to stores. And so they still pick up here uh, every Wednesday and then at uh, other times when we have a, a sale. They, uh, for example, we have we're making hot dogs now. It's uh, being they're made being made at a plant down in the south side of uh, Boston, and Black River delivers our meat down there and brings hot dogs back. And it's it's just a really uh, important and necessary service. And unfortunately, uh, Reinhardt's been purchased by some other company now. And as this consolidation goes on, I continually am worried about Black Rivers uh, being able to be sort of independent in Vermont as they are now. So it's something that we all need to watch. Yeah, that big isn't always better, right? That's right. I think the boys up in St. Albans are finding that out uh, the hard way. Um, but anyways, uh, any other questions for right now or we'll move on to Brian. Just, just a, a quick question building on the, the Black River discussion. Um, I'm always trying to figure out how we can pop out of, you know, Hannah being really good and structuring her business smartly and Paul similarly for you into, uh, and you come up with individual strategies. Sometimes they work in collaboration, but as a state, I feel like we should have more more regional, broad, broadly applicable strategies. And and one of the things I'm wondering in this conversation is, could there be a need for the state to facilitate some kind of regional, not the hub in the way we've envisioned them, but we it seems like we should not be dependent on Black River getting to each of your farms or Hannah, you partner with another farm, but rather, you know, um, a Western Addison County 
pickup every Wednesday so that you can congregate there and 200 farmers can come there, one truck, whatever. I mean, is that overly simplistic or is there a need that we could explore um, to facilitate that? Because we, we constantly hear this, people, as you guys have both proven, people want local food and farmers want to sell it. <laughs> And then we have farmers who are struggling to make money and consumers who are struggling to find local food. This is insane. And, and is there a moment here that we can capitalize on and with small inputs from the state, whether, you know, creating some facility, I mean, it doesn't have to be ornate. It could be um, just, you know, something that the county already has. I have no idea, but I wonder if you could just comment on that idea or something along those lines. All right, I'll jump on that. Um, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I just feel like the the solution is like it's like right there. It's just beyond our reach. Just like we couldn't have predicted the situation we're in now. There's an answer which is just just behind the screen, you know. And um, so that, I guess that's why I'm thinking. Well. Well, what do we already have in place? I mean, the beauty about Black River is that they, they go every place every day. Every place every day. So I send, they pick up my cheese on a Wednesday and the store has it on Thursday. And they're already going there. They're delivering to stores and restaurants every day. Uh, but I agree with Paul. I get concerned every time I hear of a buyout. And, and like in our case, they, they don't pick up here anymore. Um, which is not a huge deal for me, but it's just fortunate that I live in the world of farms and I had a lot of farms I could choose from that would generously hold my product for, for a couple hours. You know, I'd, you know I, I think it's an awesome idea. Um, I think there's a lot of people working on that, like, you know, the different food hubs and like here in Addison County, we have a group called Acorn and they actually started an online farmer's market. Um, which we had a fir the first drop-offs this, this week. So they, they took, the, they took the, the, the reins and ran with that. Um, so it, it seems like the opportunity is there, even if potentially we still use Black River, but maybe we consolidated and then uh, someone like Food Connects picked up and brought to Black River. So then people, there's a lot of farms I know that are smaller than us that would love to have Black River pick up, but they have a minimum. And maybe they just don't, they haven't they worked out the logistics. Um, so I think, it's a, I, think it's a, I think it's a great way to think. It, it's, it's along those lines of helping people shorten the food chain, creating the structure to allow people to help themselves. So uh, yeah, I could uh, add a couple words to that. Um, one of the one of the problems with the smaller farms is that you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, because my screen went blank for a minute. But any, okay, so one of the problems is that the smaller farms don't have uh, consistent product year round, which grocery stores need consistency. They can't, uh, except for really seasonal products like uh, fresh turkeys for Thanksgiving. They can't deal with. Uh, interruptions in supply and so that's one of the big issues with the smaller farms and then the second is quality of product um, so i think uh, I, I agree with hannah that there are possibilities um, but i'm wondering if um, the commercial m market is uh, is maybe the best way to let this uh, be handled because they have figured out how to do it and somebody else trying to figure out how to do it, say connected to government or some other agency, um, may be problematical. You think, you think independents can probably, that they have to make money at, at it working cheaply do a better job? Well, competition, <laughs> Competition is a big part of it. Yes. Um, other questions? Uh, well, I, just, I would just add 
several years ago, and Will, you might be able to add in, remember this. Um, several years ago, there was uh, a couple of orchards that were looking to do this type of similar thing at the old packing house in Shoreham. And um, I think it was Champlain Orchards or maybe Sunrise Orchards we're looking at a cold storage facility there to try to coordinate something similar to this. And I think the funding never came through for it. Um, I think when I was working on the Work and Lands Enterprise Board, we saw grant proposals come in uh, to use like that facility. Um, part of it now is a seed fertilizer distribution center for Seedway, but I think part of it still sits empty right on 22A in Shoreham. Yeah. You know, that's for, for Addison County, you know, that's could be kind of what you're brainstorming here, you know, Senator Pearson. Um, I think for non-perishable products, it would work fairly well. I think for the perishable products, there could be challenges. Um, and I would just add also that Black River, while they don't distribute our product, they do haul it for us to Cheshire, Connecticut, to Whole Foods. And they were stopping into our slaughterhouse twice a week in the past, picking up product. Um, and we've been informed now just once a week. So it's changed our schedule already. Um, so it means that our meat, where it was getting to the store in 10 days from kill is now going to be like 14, which we still only have a seven day hang time. So now it's in a package Kyravac for seven days. Um, we always prided ourselves on having the freshest beef in the store, you know, and, and so now it's going to be extended out and we're hoping we don't see, you know, negative results of that meat being in the package, you know, for an additional three, four, five days before it gets to the store. So um, that's just my note on Black River and on that distribution hub. I mean, that was a possibility several years ago and I don't, I think the funding just didn't come to do it. Will, do you remember that? And do you have any insight on that? Yeah. You're muted, Will. Um, I remember it. I don't have a whole lot of insight to add, Brian. Yeah. So, uh, other questions? Are we move right on to Brian? Talk a little bit about the beef. Okay. So, you know, for those that don't know, but I think most of you are familiar with our business, uh, Mountain Meadows Farms. We, an organic beef farm. We've been in business for 23 years. Uh, we're owned by a retired doctor, Dr. Emil Cooper, who lives in Boston. Uh, I manage the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, Dr. Cooper takes care of the, the marketing of the meat to the stores and, and all of the accounts receivable payable. That's his part of the business. Um, we have not seen anything detrimental. Uh, I don't think everybody was online when we chatted earlier, but we had actually taken a voluntarily quit shipping beef for a few weeks, um, starting mid-March, right about when this corona hit. Um, and we had done that just because our demand at Whole Foods is larger than what we can supply currently. We are raising about 305 to 10 calves a year. And we raise those calves from birth to slaughter. And they're slaughtered locally in Benson at Maple Ridge Meats. Um, and they're then just transported by Black River to Cheshire, Connecticut the following week. Um, year round sales, uh, other than this little hiccup that we've had. Uh, so last week we slaughtered animals and they will be picked up now on this coming Monday and brought down to Cheshire. Um, so it'll be our first delivery back since this COVID hit. Um, do, do they uh, just have them or how do you ship them, Brian? So they're, they're processed at Maple Ridge into what's called subprimals. 
So your chuck will be in a box, your rib will be in a different box, you know, everything's broke into subprimals and Whole Foods finish cuts the meat themselves and make all their yep. own ground beef and everything. We don't, we don't get into any of the retail cuts or grinding of burger or anything like that. Um, it, each store takes a minimum half carcass um, and we're supplying 23 stores. So they're, they're on a rotation. Uh, not every store gets a carcass each week. Uh, some of the smaller stores get them every other. Um, and this has worked well for 23 years. It's definitely a wholesale count. We never dabbled in the retail. Uh, myself growing up in Middlebury, Vermont, would love to see our product locally. Uh, we've never had the resources or, you know, the marketing skill to try to get into the retail market. Um, we've never done the farmer's markets. Uh, we don't even have a on-farm store. Um, and a lot of that's because Whole Foods has taken 100% of our product and we've struggled to keep up with them. Um, we manage- that's a, nice, that's a nice problem to have. It is, but as Rose Wilson told us, our business is not saleable because we deal with one, all our eggs are in one basket. Yeah. And I told Dr. Cooper that and he was quite disturbed, but it, it is reality. Um, our business is vulnerable, you know, um, and we're really vulnerable. I feel like in three or four ways and it's one whole foods would be the biggest vulnerability that if they, if they said, we no longer want your product or, or we're going to scale back, uh, that would hurt us. Number two, and I think is even bigger concern is the slaughterhouse vulnerability. And especially now with this Corona, um, so far, knock on wood, Maple Ridge Meats has been running at full operation. Um, they're actually busier than they ever have been at this time of the year because of the local demand and people who, you know, have bought a beef from a neighbor or whatever to put it in their freezer or pork. Or, you know, I, I, I saw some goats in there the other day. I haven't seen goats in there in a couple of years. Uh, so, um, but that vulnerability there, if they shut down, our product has to be processed at what's called a GMP third party audit approved facility. That is currently, Maple Ridge is currently the only facility in Vermont that is GMP approved for beef. The one down in Springfield can do some other small ruminants and pork, but they don't do beef. We wouldn't be shipping meat again if Maple Ridge shuts down due to Corona or anything else. Uh, we had been in New York in the past and they went out of business and two years ago, we didn't ship for eight weeks because it took that long to get Maple Ridge up to the standards of this third party audit. How, how big a facility is that, Brian? Maple Ridge, I think they typically, you know, they can do 20 beef a day, some hogs, you know, and they, they rotate their schedule. I think there's days they do 50 hogs, but they may not do much beef or, you know, they'll do 25 beef, 20 beef, um, you know, and a few hogs or sheep. Um, I think it's, you know, it's not as big as the one that uh, Black River is involved with down in, in Springfield, but I think it's probably one of the large, second or third largest in the state. As far is, there, as the city. is there room to, to grow that, uh, that uh, slaughter facility? Well, um, this Corona, has definitely um, gave them a lot of business and they are maxed. And I think I'm hearing other slaughter facilities are also right now, which is normally a slow time of the year. So traditionally, you know, these slaughterhouses through the summer almost lay people off some years because things slow down so much. So I think right now they're reaping the rewards of people wanting local product and knowing where their product's coming from. And it's, it's been great for them because, um, you know, a lot of times March through, 
you know, say August is a very slow time for them. And they're quite concerned. Um, I don't know, you know, the owner is young, he's 30s, early 30s. I guess I don't know if he has much desire for expansion, but, um, you know, that vulnerability and then the third vulnerability is, is you know, the transportation. Um, if Black River was to, you know, something go wrong there, we'd be scrambling to find a different hauler. We have used a hauler out in New York before. Uh, it was quite a bit more expensive because they were coming up here with an empty tractor trailer, picking up our product and bringing it down. So the price per pallet was about double of what Black River does it for. And um, so that, you know, affected us financially there. Um, I think the other things in the beef market that are concerning right now, you're all well aware of the dairy crisis and the farmers have been told to cut production, you know, 15% by a couple of the co-ops. And I think Agrimark was supposed to announce yesterday or today, what, 5% for Agrimark? Yeah. 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 Okay. I think DFA was 15, right? Yeah. So you've got all these cows that these farmers are gonna, you know, have to quit milking and they're gonna come onto the beef market. Um, I was on a conference call um, earlier this week. Um, I'm part of the Livestock Advisory Council for the state of Vermont also. And Diane Bothfeld from the Agency of the Ag was in Chris, vet, the vet, Kristen Haas, um, coordinate this conference call. And we were discussing this issue, of what are we gonna do with all these dairy culls? Um, the whole beef market's getting flooded. Meanwhile, we keep bringing in beef from Brazil and Australia every day. And our American beef market is swamped with our own product. And the price is just plummeting. Um, I think at the local sale barn in the past two weeks, we've seen a 15 cents drop on, on these animals. And the poor condition cows, uh, sick cows are really, really in the tank. Uh, you might get 15 or 20 cents a pound on the hoof for those cows. Um, but with this influx of, of other cold cows coming in, we were trying to brainstorm on what we could do when there's, you know, for the local um, economy and beef to the food shelves or whatever. Some of these cows are in good condition. And the thought is maybe we could put some out on grass with some contract grazers and stuff. And I suggested they contact grass farmers in NOFA, Maddie, um, for people who potentially have some extra pasture land that could maybe, maybe graze these cattle and they could go into the meat market slowly rather than flood it. Because the, the, the Pennsylvania buyers right now they don't want to pay anything for these cattle. There's so many coming onto the market. And <clears throat> with big slaughterhouses shutting down, you've got that concern too. Will there be a place for them to go? Even if, you know, it, I've heard it's, horror it's, stories. Go ahead. It, it's strange that, that uh, with this influx of uh, foreign beef, that there's still no beef in the stores in, in Massachusetts. I, and it's, you know, it's, but, just yeah. it's just like the dairy. They're dumping milk and, yeah. you, and there's is that people can't buy milk. And it's, it's the distribution and the processing glitch right now that can't get it to the stores. And it, as you know, as my friends, dairy farmers, friends of mine are just, you know, so frustrated. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they've got the product and, and it, they're dumping it and either in their manure pits or spreading it on their fields when the stores can't even keep it on the shelf. It's very frustrating. Um, and I, you know, the beef so far, I think people have been able to get beef, but when those big plants that kill 20, 30,000 head a day get shut down, we could see that change. Um, and there could be there's been horror stories. I've seen pictures of thousands of pigs being killed on the farm because there's nowhere to go and the pig farmer cannot raise them any longer and financially survive. 
and so can't he's, feed them. He he can't feed. He can't afford to feed them if he's not selling them, and they're they're euthanizing those pigs and burying them, and that's sad. Rose. Rose. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that is horrible, 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 Brian. And I hate thinking about that image. Um, but that is not happening in Vermont, correct? That's no, that's, no. that's elsewhere. Okay. Thank no. goodness. Um, but no. um, you know, you've raised a few uh, red flags um, for us to think about in terms of the meat business here in Vermont. And I'm really glad to hear that you're talking about sort of how can you slowly get these animals to market, maybe put them on pasture for a few months um, now that the grass is literally getting green. Um, so I, I'm glad to hear that's happening. And um, is your are your beef prices dropping? I, you have a sort of custom market in a way. Are, are you uh, feeling that? We have not. And okay. um, we have not heard anything from Whole Foods about that. I don't, we hope hope it doesn't come to that. Um, you know, we we haven't even raised our price to the stores in over a year and a half now because the regular beef market's been so soft. We haven't, you know, dared price ourselves out of the game, so to say. Um, we're lucky we're in a niche market. You yeah. know, the organic beef in the north, there's not a lot of it. And mm -hmm. we're supplying those 22 stores in New York and Boston primarily into Connecticut a little bit. They don't have other local sources, what they consider local. So, okay. you know, haven't seen the, the effects. Um, and we, we've we never had Whole Foods come to us at any other time either and say, we need a price reduction. Yeah. Um, That's so good. So a yeah. uh, couple more questions, if, if I may, Bobby. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So I, I appreciated that you identified three vulnerabilities in your business. Um, and I, I find that really interesting. And I, you know, one I want to ask about, well, all of them are really interesting, but we talked about the distribution problems and that seems to be across the board, a, an issue for all, all types of farmers, the distribution and the, the trucking, um, the slaughter facility, uh, you know, you were mentioning the larger slaughter facilities in other states being shut down because of coronavirus, but it, it seems like at least so far, knock on wood, our smaller slaughter facilities in Vermont have not had that problem. But sort of to what Paul was saying about how they're trying to figure out how to set up their facility, you know, with social distancing and everything like that, has the facility that you ship to in Benson had to change its operations in order to implement some of those kinds of practices? Well, the, the most obvious thing that I've seen is every employee was wearing a mask. They always have gloves on anyways. Um, yep. That, you know, I was very pleased to see that. I didn't know what to expect because when I went in there this past week, um, you know, the governor's definitely encouraged it, has made it mandatory, but told everybody. And so the owners of this facility, I have made it mandatory that all employees are wearing masks. And I think, you know, they've tried to cutting and wrapping the meat is slower than the guys in the back that break it down. So I think they've tried to slow down that process so that people aren't overwhelmed and crowded and you know, 10, 12 people in the same packing room. Um, mm -hmm. He does have two uh, packing rooms there. And I think they've kind of split up now into, so people are a little more spread out. Um, uh -huh. well, that's fairly cool. close contact, you know, yeah. it is still um, fairly close. Yeah. And I'm wondering sort of to Paul's point about having, you know, <laughs> health and agency of ag coming out and helping sort of assess, you know, what, what are best practices for slaughter facilities during this? Um, and um, if that could be something we as an ag committee could suggest or, you know, encourage. Well, I, think whatever. It, I think it'd be a good idea, you know, Randy, yeah. Randy Quinville and, you know, those guys could maybe come up with some ideas and um, work with the federal inspector too. I mean, they're, Maple Ridge really inspected. So it's a that's a federal inspector inspector that's there. 
and maybe there's guidelines that USDA has already put out. Yeah. From slaughterhouses, you know. I, so to, to your other point about, you know, your, your other vulnerability being just having one sort of market, um, I, I think, you know, what one of the things we're trying to figure out is what, what do we need to do to support and help agriculture get through this crisis and come out the other side more healthy and sustainable and profitable for our state. And wondering, you know, it, it seems like we have a somewhat of a direction that we're going to do to help dairy, but what do you as a beef farmer, and, and this goes to all four of you, what do you need, what, what could we do as part of our coronavirus package to help your operations get through this crisis? You know, I think the majority of the beef farmers in Vermont are a lot smaller scale than us. Um, I think we, we I think we're gonna be able to weather this easier than somebody that's trying to market um, 25 or 50 beef. I'm hoping that the local market, the farmer's markets, as, as Hannah and Paul both said, working, keeping the food chain shorter, I'm hoping smaller beef farms, that'll work really well for them. Um, you know, a lot of them don't deal wholesale like we do. They rely on the farmer's markets. It's great that they're opening back up this weekend. Um, and I think that's going to be key for a lot of them to keep going is I think that's great that that's being allowed. I'm hoping that they can sell it locally to maybe new customers that in the past have gone to, you know, Hannaford's or Shaw's um, opportunity for some of them. I think a lot of times the beat guys kind of independent and they don't like to ask for help and, and they kind of, feel their way through and, you know, sell a couple beef here to a neighbor, sell, you know, or neighbors and relatives, but maybe this is an opportunity for them and, and um, producers association to, to start to channel a little bit more of that beef and make it known that it's available. I think the biggest problem is, is some of these farms is the consistency and being able to supply it you know, year round, not just in the fall or something when they take cattle off grass. Um, maybe, I don't know, just some marketing help maybe, um, you know, and um, some resources on where they could move product to, try to interconnect them with, you know, like Farm to Plate tries to do and, and other organizations. Acorn was one that Hannah mentioned you know, I'm sure there's some beef producers that are part of Acorn also, so. Yeah, uh, Anthony, uh, you had a question? Yeah, it's just a thought really. We're going back to the pieces about talking about regionalism and also trying to release things onto the market in a way that keeps, keeps prices from falling and making sure we have steady markets throughout the year. And then we talked about cold storage for a little bit. And I've, I've always wondered whether it would make sense to have regionally based freezing facilities, maybe for smaller producers, not, not the, the ones that are directly connected to Whole Foods, but where process, farmers could bring meat, it would be slaughtered, then would be sent to a storage facility that would allow it to remain frozen until it could be released onto the market in a way that keeps the market steady. I just wonder if that is something that people think might be useful as well. And, um, I think that it might help smaller producers more than bigger ones, but it's, it reminds me a little bit of how Jasper Hill takes other people's cheeses to age, although you wouldn't have to age just to meet frozen meat, it could just hang there, but same kind of idea of allowing one facility meet the needs of a group of farmers. I just wonder whether freezing is something that would be on the list. Well, I mean, with beef, I think fresher the better, but certainly a lot of beef gets frozen. People go to the supermarket, buy beef and freeze it. So it's not, you know, it can be done. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think as things move forward, the more that people want local stuff, hopefully out of this, it may be a need that there has to be something like that and be coordinated 
where people could bring their product because not everybody's going to be able to afford to put in their own large freezer, walk-in right. freezer. I also think ultimately down the road that could be open to vegetables as well, other kind, other products that need yeah. to be stored so that we can be kept on the market throughout the year, extend the market. I believe in hardware, um, you know, they're, they're setting up sort of in that fashion, um, especially for uh, vegetables and things. And, you know, Pete Greens is up there and, and uh, that crew is working toward that. And, and they've also had problems with transportation. And we had testimony earlier, I think, where they were putting three of their own vehicles on the road to do this pickup stuff to get it to a, a central point. Uh, so, uh, and then we haven't had this meeting yet, but sometime we've got to get the ag agency on on our meetings and ask them, well, just what are you doing for the different ag sectors? And and I don't know if you folks that are testifying have have been in on any meetings with them and if they're helping along the lines that you're talking about or but we'll get to that after we get to hear you know you folks and and uh, we all need to be on the same page we and we don't need any standby people you know just sitting there sucking up air we need uh, workers and thinkers and and people putting stuff together to to get through this and to come out of it maybe stronger and better than before so uh, Will, are you, are you still growing your carrots uh, bottom side up so they come up out of the ground instead of down? Yeah, they're much easier to harvest that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to yeah, see you, Will. Me. Good to see you, good to be here. Thank you all for um, inviting me to join you and thank you all for your work and interest in this. Um, for the record, my name's Will Stevens. My wife and I uh, own and operate Golden Russet Farm in Shoreham. We're a certified organic vegetable operation and have um, two greenhouses that we sell bedding plants from. We've been at it since 1981 and uh, still at it. And we're in the process of turning things over to our daughter. Uh, we're in the third year of that transition. Um, so uh, over the years we've marketed um, probably every way possible, including uh, as a member of the Deep Root Co-op. Uh, we did 30 years of farmer's markets. We had a CSA for 21 years um, and, uh, and are continuing with that. Um, <clears throat> we sell uh, locally to stores and restaurants. Um, 90 plus percent of everything we produce is actually consumed within 15 miles of the farm. Um, and that's been our niche uh, that we've evolved to. Uh, we didn't get into this because of any great business plan, quite honestly. It's just, it just happened that way. Um, but we're glad to be here. And um, frankly, uh, I have very little to complain about, uh, given what I'm hearing today and, and what I'm hearing from others around. Um, in terms of uh, kind of where our business is today, uh, we're seeing a resurgence of interest in a regional food economy, similar to what we saw in the recession in 2008, 2009. People want their victory gardens. They want control over their destiny again, as much as possible. So they're putting in gardens. Um, they're looking for seeds. They're looking for plants. Um, uh, and, and I'll get into our role in that in a second. Um, as, as an essential operation, a food uh, operation, where um, I'm, I'm crying in my beer a little bit because we, we ran out of food in March. Uh, our storage vegetables and we're not quite into the spring season yet. We're not quite harvesting spinach. Our asparagus is up, but it's not ready for market yet. So we're kind of in between, but where we are is in the non-essential piece of uh, plants and ornamentals. Um, but that's about a third of our income, uh, bedding plant sales in May and June. So um, what we've been navigating for the last couple months has been, um, uh, <laughs> I can frame it best by saying, what if we gave a party and nobody came? 
because that was our fear because we get the first greenhouse up and running in the, in the beginning of March. And a couple weeks after that is when, you know, the COVID piece hit. Um, it was a little late for us to change our plans. Um, so we decided to go full, full speed ahead and, and figure it out as we, as we move along. Fortunately, our daughter is, is uh, tech savvy. Um, and uh, so for a couple of weeks, literally, we spent a lot of time developing a, a curbside uh, pickup pre-order platform that we could use on our website, which didn't exist uh, in the beginning of March. Um, it's it's, uh, it's uh, time and energy we didn't budget for, certainly, but it's critical to uh, uh, staying in place, frankly. Um, we know from sales so far that um, the vegetables are high on everybody's list, uh, flowers not so much. Um, uh, part of our business, about 10% of our total sales uh, is cut flowers, uh, weddings and bouquets uh, that go to retail operations. We have no idea where that's gonna go this year. Um, although we've had one wedding already canceled, which is no surprise. Um, but, uh, and, and interest in you know, CSA is, is you know, uh, off the charts. Not surprisingly, um, we're now uh, with the governor's amendment. Um, we're now able to offer limited um, visits to the farm. People are really missing the fact that they can't go in the greenhouses, wander around, and um, subject themselves to impulse buying. Um, and Mother's Day is coming up. That's a huge weekend for us. And uh, with hanging baskets and all that kind of stuff that people don't have access to, it's been a real concern of ours. So when the amendment came to allow limited uh, participation, we had to figure out what we wanted to do. We'd spent two hard weeks developing this curbside service platform. And now all of a sudden we had to decide, do we want to spend time and energy into setting up some sort of appointment system or some sort of uh, traffic cop kind of arrangement or stay the course and just keep it on curbside. And we've decided uh, that we are, uh, hopefully this afternoon we'll go live with some kind of an appointment system where people can sign up online uh, for an hour at a time uh, and we'll limit it to uh, two people an hour uh, to come and wander through the greenhouses with masks and gloves and um, uh, pick out their own plants as opposed to but our picking and pulling. Aren't those, aren't those uh, your greenhouses must be big. I mean, to socially uh, distance properly, you could probably have 15 in there. Yeah, that's right. That, that, you know, we could. We're limited to um, 10 per facility, including employees. And so, um, so that's an issue. We have, uh, you know, on any day right now, we have six employees wandering around. Sometimes most of them are, well, some of them are in the greenhouses and others are, of us are out in the field. Um, so, but if we had two people in a greenhouse, we couldn't have more than eight customers anyway. And then if you do the square feet, we're allowed uh, one customer or one person per 200 square feet. So um, yeah, so we could, we could handle more, but right now it's limited to 10. So we have to manage that. And we're going with the low number just to, just yeah. to try to manage that. Yeah, to be safe. Yeah. Right, exactly. Because at the end of the day, that's, we remind ourselves, it's about safety. It's not about you know, our marketing or our business. Um, right. So we need to be there. You know, I don't, I don't want Golden Russet Farm to be a hotspot, frankly. You know, not, not, nobody does. And so we have to do that. Um, so, but, but it's been interesting in the sense that um, I, I guess I believe that, that farmers are, are kind of mercenary opportunists. And uh, so we're, we're in reactive mode right now, trying to figure out, like everybody I've heard today, you know, we're trying to figure it out. We're, we're making it up as we go along. We're trying to figure out what, are, what, the, what the solution is to get us through the moment. And then um, interestingly too, what's gonna stick? You know, what are we going to be doing, adopting as a policy next year? Um, what works, what doesn't? And we're, we're learning as we go. It's, 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 pretty, it's been pretty fascinating that way. Um, we are a, uh, what you would, might call a hyper-local farm. I told you that 90 plus percent of our uh, uh, product ends up in the end user uh, within 15 miles of the farm. Uh, that's that's uh, been, been a real benefit to us at this point in time. Um, because uh, we have strong relationships with our customers and, and Hannah has it right. I, you know, we're on that relational side of, of the you know, agricultural spectrum in the state. Um, we have a lot of control over our markets, over our product selection, because from year to year we can meet demand. We're price setters pretty much. We're not price takers. Um, 
you know, and, and we work with folks. And, and the, the, one of my takeaways in talking to the local general stores and other folks who are kind of front lines in this is, is that the hope is that people will remember once we've kind of got through this, what producers, what everybody here today is doing and trying to do in order to deliver product and deliver needs uh, really as a service for folks, um, because that's part of what we're doing too. It's not just about you know marketing products and so forth, it's providing service. And I think that's where um, we can get it right uh, strategically going forward. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I can pause there if you have questions or. Um, are there questions for, um, for Will at, at this point in time? <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, well, it's good, Will, you, you kind of figured it out rolling along here and it sounds like, um, uh, you know, you're, you're keeping your head above water and, <laughs> and, uh, serving, serving your, your area people very well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me say that if it wasn't for our daughter, Pauline, uh, we would probably throw in the towel, frankly, because I personally am a technological Luddite. Um, <laughs> and I, I, my flip phone still works pretty well uh, when I remember to turn it on. Um, so fortunately, you know, uh, we have uh, someone in house who can help us get to that next place. And of course, the goal is that it's her place uh, in another couple of years. And so she has an interest in this. And so I guess I'm going to take this opportunity to put a shout out to the uh, Farm and Forest Viability Program because uh, we've been working with them for the last couple of years to help with that transition. So in yeah. terms of, you know, Senator Pearson's question of, you know, kind of what can be done and so forth, um, you know, uh, continued support for that program uh, is huge. Um, once upon a time back in the 80s, the Ag Agency had a pretty robust development division, which over the years has been shrinking. Uh, as, as they navigate that space between inspection and regulation and development. And I think that uh, if, if, if they needed more or felt the need for more resources, then maybe that would be a place to look. Um, Senator Starr, you may remember the Ag Development Board from a, yeah. several years ago that disappeared when Working Lands came around, uh, tragically in my opinion, because I think that uh, to answer Senator Hardy's question and Senator Pearson's concern, about what can the state do or what can you do as a legislative committee. Um, that board was set up to uh, provide an overview of the state of agriculture and to identify goals for where agriculture can be in the future, 2050, 2100, a long-term view free from politics. And they had perspectives that I was intentionally uh, made up of folks with a variety of perspectives on Vermont's agriculture and food system who could, um, uh, free from uh, repercussion, make recommendations, do deep dive studies. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that they were never funded and, and they didn't have the resources to do the work that, that some of us in the legislature at the time kind of felt that they could provide. And to me, um, one of the problems, as you know better than I probably in politics, is that long-term vision is, is often not rewarded. So if, if, if it can't be done politically, then maybe you have to look outside of the political realm to figure out kind of, okay, so who can we turn to for guidance and perspective? And uh, the, in the absence of the Ag Development Board, I don't know. Um, another piece of dealing with the regional aspect that's come up a little bit is, I don't know if you've heard from Ellen Kaler and full disclosure, I'm on her board, uh, Sustainable Jobs Fund, but she's um, working on a regional initiative um, that has great promise where uh, for synergies between the various states of meeting you know, need and oversupply. So I think that, um, you know, if you haven't heard from her, she hasn't talked to you about her thinking around this, I, I would suggest that you do that. Um, it's, a, it's very exciting, so. I think I've got her working on that beef issue in, with Massachusetts. And oh, uh, <clears throat> she, has, she has more energy than eight normal people, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'm um, into that. <laughs> um, any other questions for Will? If not, uh, Anthony, uh, Ruth? I, I just, I just want to underscore what you said, um, Will, about how you hope people will remember. And I, I think that that's a really important thing for us to um, think about. And how do we help people remember what local agriculture has done during this crisis? 
and and what local businesses and and local people and volunteers and helpers and healthcare workers and everybody has done how do we help people remember when life goes back to quote unquote normal um so thank you for that i think that was a great phrase yeah thanks i, I you know to that point um and and brian was talking about uh maple ridge and and so forth um you know right now uh, they are as busy as can be. And, and it seems like, wow, you look at it and say, geez, maybe they should expand or maybe they can take on more capacity and so forth. But if after this bump, the demand goes down again, they have, they're stuck. Yeah. They have no interest or really no return on investment if they do make that jump. So um, on the one hand, you don't want to waste a good crisis. But on the other hand, you also have to be careful and thoughtful about how you respond to it. So you don't yeah, set yourself up. Afterwards, and that, I agree, Will, and that's why I pointed out lots of lots of years they're looking at laying off employees in the summer. So it's not a this this bump, you know, is definitely helping them, but long term, who knows? Um, exactly. But yeah. you know, local, if people remember who got them through this, being ag and small businesses, and. Uh, Maybe people will be looking for more local beef and poultry and pork, and and maybe it can help these slaughterhouses too. And in the end, you know, it, it could be stronger, but that's that's the unknown. You know, will people remember? There's been a huge disconnect, I think, with society and where the food comes from. Maybe this will be a resurgence of that, and people will realize they do need farms. Bob, yeah, maybe, yeah, Chris, go ahead. Mark, could I, could I uh, say a, a word? Sure. Yeah. So um, I uh, <clears throat> agree with uh, the trend of the conversation very much. Uh, like Will, we're uh, transitioning our farm. Well, we have actually and sold our farm business to our son, Peter, and his wife, Sigrid. And he was just here a minute ago, but he got called by a customer who came to buy some turkey products. So I was hoping to have him on, but he can't be on. But I think for us, for this Corona crisis and getting through this, some help from the Department of Agriculture, possibly the Department of Health on how to proceed would be most important. I think it might be important for a lot of other farmers too. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Paul. Chris, I think you had a question. I, I just, you know, to back up what people have said, uh, but with a little twist, I, I don't think we should hope that uh, Vermonters will remember in the way that people have articulated. I think people have time right now to take that extra step and go find local food. But it's it's my opinion that people always want this. And it's incumbent on us as a state with our partners to, when we surface, have it continue to be easy. I think that's the missing piece that people always have this desire. It's been highlighted right now because we're all afraid and, and the, the global food chain has come into focus. But I hope uh, rather than pin our uh, the future on, on a sort of uh, gratitude attitude, I will. <laughs> we will actually just have set up some process so that it's easy because people are busy and, and uh, they will buy that local product if it's right there uh, where they're buying the rest of their stuff. And that's why I, I, I just continue to harp on these um, facilities that we can offer as a state we can promote, we can even possess, like, like own ourselves or work with local partners to uh, do all the, make, to, to accumulate all of the good work that is happening across the landscape um, in, in Vermont Farm. So I, it, it's a sort of yes and for me, and I, I just wanted to put that out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I wonder, um, we, We've got to go on a Senate uh, floor time at 1030, but I want to get everybody in. Uh, Anthony, is your friend John showing up yet? I, I haven't seen 
Uh, you had John Erickson coming. Well, we, it's just a John Erickson, but we also the question was well, how many people to try to squeeze into one meeting. Well, so we maybe, got we got John, and if he's here with us, and and Maddie left, Maddie. and Michael's, you know, to give a a little overview for non dairy farmer uh, program. Well, both John and Maddie have been thinking long term about some of the things we can do to strengthen agriculture in the long run. So that deserves a conversation on its own, maybe after this one is over. But Maddie's here for now. Maybe we should let her sort of talk for a little bit and then have a time when we get. John Erickson is from the Gund Institute at UVM, and he's done a lot of long term thinking and a lot of creative thinking about systems and how to make investments in, in long term systems that would strengthen agriculture and the rural economy. And so that's sort of a it's the same conversation, but it would take some time to happen, I think. Yeah. So we might so, want to invite him back another time and maybe hear a little bit from Maddie today or have Maddie and John both come back another time and have a John is on the line. John, John is yeah. on the line? With you. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Linda just sent me the link. Who, who else is trying to, who is trying to get on to audio, Linda? There's that extra. Ruth, it was me. Oh. And well, if if we could have John postpone his thing, we could go to Maddie because she's been patiently waiting and listening. And you haven't offered too many comments, Maddie, but uh, I'm sure you've been saving. I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So go ahead, Maddie. Uh, yeah. So great. Are you Thank you so much. I really appreciate the discussion. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you froze up for a little while, but I think you're back. Okay, great. Yeah, my internet is not always the best, so I'll, hopefully you'll be able to hear me. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the discussion. And I'm really glad, actually, that all the farmers had a chance to speak before me, because I think that hearing those stories directly is critical um, and, and really informative. So thank you all so much. Um, yeah, I have a lot to say and I'll try to keep it brief, but you know, some of what I have to say is our overall comments about, you know, the critical nature of this moment. Some are really specific suggestions um, that I think the committee can, you know, can take to heart. Um, but yeah, overall, as so many of you have mentioned, this is such a critical moment, I think, for the state setting a for the long term to move to an agricultural economy that's more diverse, more resilient, more locally based, that is focused on feeding Vermonters, keeping Vermont farms in business, and less on exporting food to the cities. Um, as you've heard from farmers just now, shortening our supply chains and diversifying are the keys to an emergency ready food system. Um, and I think that's how we should be thinking about this. You know, there are a lot of opportunities to um, both respond to the immediate needs of crisis while laying the groundwork to create this food system that we need in the long term. I don't think it's an either or like Chris was saying, it's kind of a yes and um, proposition in my mind. And I really appreciate Will talking about the Ag Development Board because I think that uh, that type of work is really what we need are some clear goals for the state um, to set and that we can all collectively work through. I think that's really the work we need to desperately to engage in right now um, while we have this kind of critical moment. Um, I also want to agree with Chris. I made a note as, as you all were talking that we don't want to hang our hopes on people remembering. I think that we all know that, you know, maybe some portion of the increased demand for local food that we're seeing right now is going to continue, but certainly not all of it. Um, so I think we do need to be proactively thinking about what we can do to support integrating local food directly into our system systems to keep that demand strong and to continue to support the people who are feeding us during this time. Um, I would also really echo what Will said that farmers are not um, just pivoting, you know, in their own business interests to continue to access markets. They're pivoting as a service to people. And we really need to recognize that. Um, so as you've already heard, farmers other than dairy farmers are also struggling due to the loss of wholesale markets like restaurants, schools, and colleges. Um, and some farmers are able to scale up and sell more through CSAs and farm stands and farmers markets, which is great for those who can and who are set up that way. Um, but as you heard from, you know, Brian in particular was a good example. These are different farms in a lot of cases um, from those who sell wholesale. So I don't want uh, the, legislator to get the legislator to get the idea that all 
just um, and respond to that and be fine because that's not the case for everybody. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of farms who don't currently have a CSA or sell direct through farmers markets who don't have those relationships, the infrastructure or the staffing to just start selling through those channels. Um, and it's not clear, I think, to anybody at least not to me, how the CARES Act money um, that was allocated you know, for USDA to give out is going to support diversified or organic producers, um, many of whom, similarly to dairy, as I know you all have discussed, are potentially facing greater losses in the second and third quarters than the first quarter. So I think that's really important to keep in mind that you know, it's not clear how, how much support is going to go to them through that money. Um, and so I think that it's important for the state to provide direct payments uh, to farmers who have lost major markets in these other sectors, the same as you're considering doing for dairy. Uh, I think, you know, one thing that Hannah touched on, which I was going to mention, is the idea of, of providing these mini grants to support farmers who are able to pivot and consider new markets. Um, you know, I know that Hannah was the recipient of one through the Center for an Ag Economy, which is great. Um, and we at NOFA are also doing some of this. We started a fund to provide what we're calling resilience grants um, to producers who, you know, are able to pivot and consider new markets or potentially expand to meet <clears throat> the demand that they're seeing. Um, but we have a really limited funding pool, as I'm sure other, you know, service providers um, do, but we're positioned, uh, as Hannah said, too, for technical service providers like NOFA and others in the Farm Viability Program um, to step in and assist producers in, in making these moves um, and to help get the funds out, but we need the funding to be allocated, and I think that's where um, you all can come in. And in terms of those mini grants, I wanted to share a couple of other examples that I think are really um, great ones to lift up. I don't, maybe some of you are aware of this, but there are many of these sort of um, ad hoc food hubs forming around the state. Maple Wind Farm is a great example in Chittenden County, um, where they're partnering with other businesses uh, who sell things like, you know, Maple Wind is a meat producer and they are partnering with a mushroom producer um, and Knoll Farm who grows berries down in Waitsfield and they're doing home delivery uh, all over Chittenden County but they are not passing those costs on to customers um, and I've heard Bruce Hennessy from Maple Wind say that they are um, the cost for them is about ten dollars per delivery uh, and they are just eating that cost right now. So he has suggested that they could demonstrate that cost and be compensated for it um, as one of the options for you know, funding support for these efforts. Uh, another similar effort is happening in the Northeast Kingdom. It's called Kingdom Direct, and it was started by a flower farm and a bakery called Ardelia Farm. And they are in Irisburg and they're partnering with a bunch of is to provide everything from prepared food to like grocery products even. I know they're doing um, eggs and flour part of their delivery. Uh, they're partnering with Butterworks Farm who makes yogurt and things like buttermilk and, um, and cream to deliver farm products and prepared food all the way from Irisburg to Burlington. Um, so that's a really exciting effort and I think something that you know the state could support that could potentially sustain in the long haul uh, and, and provide food to an area like the Northeast Kingdom that might be, you know, otherwise underserved. Um, I also think that, you know, Hannah touched on this, but it's critical that we still have food available to be sold to restaurants and other um, wholesale markets like the institutions when they do reopen. So we don't necessarily want all the farmers to pivot to direct sales in a way that will make local sourcing difficult um, for these larger accounts like restaurants and institutions when the time comes. So I think that's just another important thing to keep in mind. Um, I also, I've seen some great ideas come through and I'd be curious to know, you know what Brian and others in the meat processing uh, and production world think about these, but um, you know, is there anything the state can do to reduce restrictions on the meat that is sold at retail to, go, to have to go through the audit system that Brian talked about? Uh, is there any way you know, that we can either temporarily or permanently um, reduce some of those restrictions while obviously still making sure that the meat that's being sold at retail is safe. Um, there's kind of a, a list that I'll share with you quickly of ideas that I've seen to support limited size meat process, which could be really critical to some of the diversity that um, it sounds like we need. Uh, so the first one is what I just mentioned, you know, removing the restrictions on retail sales of meat that requires it to be processed at a USDA certified plant. Um, so that, you know, smaller processors can be a resource for farmers to expand and meet demand. Um, you know, other support for small and medium-sized processors to expand their, their facilities. 
uh, workforce development for skilled meat cutters could be a really critical aspect of this because, you know, as Paul noted, they're relying on um, H2A workers coming in from Jamaica. Um, and I know that those are, you know, long term folks who have been here for a long time, and that goes for other industries as well. Um, so I think, you know, ag workforce development is a really critical piece of this so that we are skilling up people who can do those jobs here in Vermont. Um, and right alongside that goes with making sure that those jobs pay a fair wage and can you know attract young people to careers in this work who can stay in Vermont. Um, and then lastly, I think one key piece of this uh, that could be important to consider is support for processors to become certified organic, because I think there is a limit and maybe this is something that um, you know, you've run into or you can speak to better, Brian, but there's uh, a limit of the, the number of processors who are certified organic to process organic meat. And personally, just from a consumer standpoint, I have a lot of trouble sourcing the meat that I would like to buy um, certified organic. There is really seems to be a dearth of that in the state and I would love to see that scaled up. Um, and I don't think I'm the only one experiencing that. So I just want to emphasize, you know, I think some of what we can and should be doing right now is setting ourselves up for a more emergency ready food system coming out of this. Um, I, we see at NOFA the local food incentive bill that this committee was working on prior to COVID as a critical part of setting the framework for a more resilient system. Um, I think investing in local sourcing in schools and other institutions and in the charitable food system is really, we should be thinking of it as part of an insurance policy to make sure that Vermonters are fed and that Vermont farmers have reliable contracts year after year. Um, those are just huge opportunities in those markets. And I think it's gonna take some investment um, on the state's part to, to really build out that, that demand. Um, some specific ideas on that front, specific to the charitable food system um, or food for food insecure Vermonters are that the state can invest in three specific programs. Um, one is Vermonters Feeding Vermonters, which is a program run by the Vermont Food Bank that uh, purchases food from Vermont farmers at market rates to distribute through the food bank locations. Um, that's a great win-win program for obvious reasons because it's supporting farmers and getting you know nutritious food to people that need it. Um, two programs that NOFA runs specifically are Farm Share. Um, which provides subsidized CSA shares and we partner with farms all over the state um, to do that and that's another great way to not only you know support farmers because farmers are still um, you know I, I, farmers pay in some amount but they're still getting um, the support from uh, the subsidy that supports people's ability to buy these shares um, but it also introduces people who may not otherwise be buying direct from these farmers to start doing that um, in a way that so many people are for the first time right now and kind of gets them hooked you know in theory for years to come um, crop cash is another program that we run that provides an incentive using Three Squares Vermont benefits um, at farmers markets. They're able to double their money when they're purchasing um, fresh fruit and vegetables. So I think those are three programs that are really exemplary of the kind of uh, creative thinking that we can do to kind of leverage support for Vermont farmers while making sure that people are fed. Uh, also, the last specific area that I want to touch on is support for farm workers. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the hazard pay bill that's being considered right now, um, I understand that the way that bill is being viewed is really as a support mechanism for frontline workers who are at increased risk because they're interacting with the public. Um, and I think some farm workers clearly fall under that category. And those are, you know, folks that are staffing CSA pickups, farm stands, farmers markets, um, greenhouses, as we'll kind of mentioned, I think they should be included in that because they are, you know, potentially as exposed um, as other frontline workers who are, who are being uh, supported in that bill, which I think is a great thing. So I'd like to see that expanded. Uh, I also really want to emphasize what I know this committee has heard that the state should create a separate relief fund for um, farm workers who are left out of federal relief efforts. You know, there are a lot of folks who are really underpinning our ag economy in the state who are critical to our farms and to getting Vermonters fed, um, who are not currently eligible to receive stimulus checks through the government um, and who may not be eligible for other you know, financial supports who don't have paid sick leave. Um, that's another thing that NOFA has is a relief milking fund and program where we've signed up um, folks with milking experience to fill in on dairy farms when there is a need, because as we all know, that work can't stop if a farmer gets sick or if a worker is sick. Um, and so as part of that, we are 
um, not only signing people up to be at the ready, we have, I think, 60 qualified milkers signed up all over the state, um, but we are also paying for workers. We're making sure that workers who have to be out sick um, because they have COVID can still get paid for that time. Um, so that's an example of a fund and you know this, that the state could support or do something similar um, to make sure that those workers are covered because they are very critical. Um, so those are some ideas. Oh, did you want to ask a question? Well, I wanted that I wanted to have Michael uh, address the committee. Uh, I had him working on non-dairy, a non-dairy type system. How we might possibly uh, be able to help, uh, like the turkey farm, the beef farm, the veggie farm, um, and I wanted to have Michael um, have a few minutes just to run through that uh, a rough outline of how we might be able to do that and see everybody then could think about it. And then next week when we come back, um, you know, we could get into that portion of it by, I kind of wanted to get that out to at least while the farmers we're on the, uh, the non-dairy farmers are on the, the screen here. So you could be thinking about that. So Michael, you wanna, you wanna uh, give the committee a little update on where we are with that? Sure, so uh, Senator Starr asked me to look at, at ways that you could provide assistance to farms other than uh, dairy farms. Uh, and one of the considerations was the fact that some farms might actually be doing well right now because of the of the turn to local food and um, the increased demand. So it I, I, that made me me think that the program would have to be based on some sort of loss and or demonstrated loss, uh, and that made me look at um, USDA's disaster relief programs. Um, they have a program called WIP, Wildfires, Hurricanes, Indemnity um, Protection, um, which provides farmers with funds when they can prove a loss. Um, I, I think the WIP program is, is pretty involved and, and probably overly burdensome for what you would want to do, but you could probably structure a program that's similar. You create a fund, I'll just call it a disaster relief fund, um, and you then set up criteria for farmers to apply to the fund for assistance. Um, by demonstrating some loss due to COVID or, or loss due to market conditions. Um, I think that would be very doable from a legislative perspective, um, like building the language and the criteria. The question would be who would administer, um, what kind of workload it would require at whatever agency would administer it. Um, and it also addresses that that concern that that you're not giving a farmer that's doing well a windfall, um, and it's different from dairy because dairy, because of the federal market order, the the regulatory price structure, you know that they are not going to to succeed over the next few months that they will have losses. Um, so that's a distinction that can be made between the direct payment to dairy and, and setting up sort of a disaster relief fund for farmers who have losses. Um, do you have any questions? <clears throat> um, but we, uh, so, I mean, we wanna, we wanna help, you know, people um, as much as we can there's certain program aspects that we can adjust and, and promote, uh, but there's, you know, there's also the financial side of it where we could help you financially if you've taken some losses. And uh, it, it sounds like we need to, we as a committee, 
um, or the legislature needs to set a process up to to do this. And I wanted to get you folks to thinking about different processes if you've ever gone through any in the past and how they worked. Uh, so we, if we decide to do that, we'd have an, um, the ability to uh, put something together that would work, you know, easily and and not uh, have a lot of red tape put to it. Uh, so we could get it out the door uh, for you. I also wanted to mention that the chair asked me to contact Vita to see what buying down interest rates by a point on, on all farm loans um, for three months would uh, achieve. Uh, and the new director of uh, Vita got back to me very quickly. Um, she said it probably won't do that much no. for for a dairy portfolio, three months of interest is $163,000. For the non-dairy portfolio, three months of interest is $112,000. So a 1% reduction in their rates will not have a material impact on their cash flow. Um, the dairy portfolio overall is $65 million at Vita, and non-dairy is $45 million. Um, in the case of dairy, she says, farmers can't afford any payments with milk prices significantly below production costs right now. Um, so she is she's very willing to brainstorm with the committee uh, on ways to to address the the pressures on both dairy and non-dairy farmers and and the the debt load that they might be under. Um, but she, she doesn't have any specific um, solution right now. But she's, she's, she was really, she was great. She got back to me immediately, said she needed some time, worked on it, got back in a couple of hours and, and has been very, very responsive and, and open to, to finding a solution. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Michael. Are there questions for Michael yeah. uh, from the committee? Uh, Chris? Yeah, Mike, yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, we had a wardrobe change here. We, we're about to get on the Senate floor. Um, <clears throat> Michael, your, your context is uh, for non-dairy is people with a demonstrable loss of income. And, you know, that's straightforward, I guess, at some level. But I'm interested in your opinion of whether or not uh, CARES Act or federal money could be applied in a different context. And, and, and let me just try to ask you if you think this would work and maybe take some research, but the idea that a community, as a community, as a county, as a state, we are the, the COVID reaction that we wanna guard against in the fall, in the months ahead, is the vulnerability in our food supply network. We've talked all day about shortening the food chain. And are, do we think it would be eligible for us to invest some of this federal money in strengthening that? So it's not about somebody's income, but it's about making investments so that we're more resilient next time. Maybe we get pieces of it in place so we're more resilient in the fall, but but that we're clearly protecting the community in a way that happens to enhance the rural economy and, and Vermont agriculture, but is less dependent on, you know, the income at a particular farm and what's happened in the last two months there, and rather is focused on community resilience um, and, and broader agricultural economy for the state. Do, do, does that make any sense, my question? It does. Uh, I sent you out a, a document this morning from U.S. Treasury. It provides guidance to states on how the state coronavirus relief funds may be used. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there are three major criteria. And the first is that uh, it, 
the state those state funds can be used only to cover costs that are necessary expenditures incurred due to the public health emergency. They go on to define what a necessary expenditure is. It's a requirement that the expenditure be incurred due to the public health emergency it means that the expenditure must be used for actions taken to respond to the public health emergency. These may include um, the direct expenditures needed to uh, address the emergency, such as addressing medical or public health needs, as well as expenditures incurred to respond to second order effects of the emergency, such as providing economic support to those suffering from employment or business interruptions due to COVID-19 related business closures. So I think what you've been talking about direct payments to farmers, a relief fund, that I think qualifies. Building out the system into yeah. the future, yeah. I would think I would need to think about how to do that in order to qualify here. We've had conversations with NCSL about how much how much oversight and and kind of how tight the grip Treasury is going to have in in enforcing these conditions. NCSL, they're in an awkward position because they 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 don't know what Treasury wants to do, and I don't know if Treasury knows what what they want to do or what they're going to approve. Um, but they're saying that other states are kind of taking the approach of we'll ask for forgiveness instead of approval. That can be a little dangerous because there's clawback provisions in the CARES Act. You don't want to spend $500 million and then have to pay it back, um, right? Uh, so, and there's a push uh, from the federal delegation to make the, these, these criteria go away or to, to make it much more flexible in the use of those funds. So right now, my gut is building out into the future probably wouldn't be a necessary expenditure in response to COVID. But I think there's imagination and creativity and some political pressure to try to make these criteria um, work uh, for that type of thing. And Stephanie, do you have anything you want to add? We got to go. Um, just on the, 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 yeah, the NCSL conversation, we do get the sense that they do want money deployed quick, as quickly as we can um, as well from those conversations. So that's the only ad I have there. I did interrupt Stephanie, but we have to go to the floor and I was just wondering if we could meet on Tuesday morning, just the committee to, to talk about ideas that we might have to ruminate over the weekend after this conversation and <laughs> look at the stuff Michael sent. Well, I think that that's what I want to do is meet early next week and you guys think about what Michael said and, and where we want to go. And I'd like to thank the, the farm uh, people for being on. Uh, really appreciate your time. Um, it seems like every meeting we have, we whether it's an hour and a half or two hours, we run out of time, but we aren't we aren't going to forget you folks and we uh, appreciate what you do and we'll uh, get you back on at another time uh, to review what the heck we're doing. So I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to thank John Erickson for his patience and sitting through this meeting <laughs> without having a chance to talk. Yeah, I'm sorry, John, uh, John, we'll get you on though as soon as we can. So appreciate it. Thanks, Thank, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And